there are two approaches to statistics. There's inferential statistics, which try to make conclusions about the data using statistical techniques, and then there's descriptive statistics. With descriptive statistics, we're trying to des describe the data using either graphs or tables or figures, or with some numbers such as means and variances. When we describe the data, we're really looking at describing two different things. We're trying to describe the location or where most of the points fall, uh, or we're trying to describe the dispersion or the spread of the data. With the location, you can think of it as describing central tendency. We're trying to see where the mean, where most of our points clump. Uh, for dispersion, we're really looking at the spread or the scale or the variability of our data. So what we're going to do is we're going to generate some random numbers that we will use throughout this, this presentation. When we make these random numbers, we're going to use uh, the random number generators built into R. We're going to generate some normally distributed data, data from a Poisson distribution, and data from an exponential distribution. By doing all three, we should see uh, how some of our data can can look if it's non-normal. But before we generate these random numbers, we're going to do something called setting the seed. When random numbers are generated by the computer, they're not really random. What happens is the computer uses the system time as a starting point, and then it uses a formula to figure out the next starting point for the random number. If we were to start our random number generation at exactly the same time, then in theory we should get exactly the same numbers, but there's always going to be a slightly different time when we hit the enter key. So no matter how much we try to time it, there's going to be milliseconds off and that's going to be enough to generate a new sequence of numbers. However, we can actually tell R to start at a specific number and we would use set.seed to do that. So what we're going to do is, is use set.seed, we're going to give it a number so that way everyone has the exact same sequence of, of random numbers. The distributions that we're going to use will be the random normal distribution, and here's the general format. Uh, so n is how many points we want, and mean and standard deviation describes our normal distribution. If you don't understand this, that's okay. We, we will cover this distribution. For the Poisson distribution, we want to generate a certain number of, of samples, and we're going to pull it from lambda, which is basically the mean. Uh, the mean, lambda, defines our Poisson distributions. For the exponential distribution, rate defines our distribution. And again, we generate n random numbers. So here's the code that I want you to run. All right, Take this code, get it into R, R Studio, and run it. So here's mine. I took this code, copied and pasted it, uh, and then I'm going to run it. And what you see is that we generate three different vectors. If, you, if we compare our environments, you should see that our numbers match. They are identical. This is what set the seed does. If I were to regenerate just this av1, so I will do control enter to run it, you'll see that my numbers change and they're going to keep changing every time I generate I run the random number generator but if I set the seed first and then run it then I go back and everyone has the exact same number so I ask in the presentation what does each of these lines mean well set the seed function uh, sets the starting point for a random number generation set seed So it's a starting place for the random number generator. This guarantees that we obtain the exact same vectors. What about the second line? Well, I won't write this out, but we'll verbalize it. What we are doing is generating 10 samples from a normal distribution 
where that distribution has a mean of 15, standard deviation of 3. From that, we will round it to the first decimal place. For it. And then we save it as the vector av1, or as the object av1. Second line, we're going to generate 10 data points from the chi-square distribution. Chi-square distribution has 4 degrees of freedom. Uh, we're also going to round those data, but we're going to round it to the zero digit, so to the whole numbers, and then save that object as, as the object av2. Lastly, we will generate 100 random numbers from the Poisson distribution. We're going to define the Poisson distribution to have a lambda of 1.5. Uh, we don't have to round because uh, these data are whole numbers already, and then we will save it as av3. So continuing. We're going to start with statistics of central tendency or location with the, exen with the exception of interquartile range because we'll introduce that when we, when we do medians. All right, so the first measure of central tendency is the arithmetic mean. This is the most common measure of central tendency, and it really represents the center of the observations. So if we were to take our data, create a histogram, and then place the histogram on a scale, the balance point of that histogram is going to represent the mean. How we calculate it is to, is to use this equation, and hopefully you've, you've already calculated the mean by hand. So the mean, sample mean, is abbreviated x-bar or y-bar or z-bar, depending on what, what we name our variable. So by convention, I'm going to use x-bar for our mean. The mean is calculated as the sum of all of our data points divided by the number of data points that we have in our sample. All right, so our average is the sum of our, our data points divided by our sample size. For example, here's these numbers, 5, 6, 6, 7, 7, 8, 9, and 12. How do we calculate the average? Well, we're going to use this equation. So the arithmetic mean is calculated using this equation. x bar equals the sum of our x's divided by the sample size. For our data set, we're going to add up all of our data. So 5 plus 6 plus 6 plus 7 plus 7 plus 8 plus 9 plus 12. And then divide by the sample size. Our sample size is 8. So running this through the calculator I get 60 divided by 8 which is equal to 7.5. That is the average of our vector. Now, I wrote this out longhand. If you were going to do this on the exam, what I would do, I would first give the equation of the mean, then I would use the calculator and add up the values and write 60, and fill in 8 for our sample size, and 7.5. And then I ask that you circle or box the answers, so that way I can easily find it. By writing out the entire equation and showing your work, I can award you half uh, partial credit. So if you accidentally typed in 6, 6 divided by 8, you'll get a different mean, the wrong mean. But if you showed your work and actually demonstrated that you had this correct, then I could give you partial credit. So if this is a three-point problem, I would only subtract one point because of the incorrect answer. So you'll notice that when I calculate the mean, I reported it as 7.5. And you should wonder, how much should we round? Some people would say, well, if we have whole digits here, that we should round to that whole digits. And I actually would argue, and the convention argues, that you should always go to one more digit for the averages than what you have for the raw data. So here, our raw data is whole numbers. Our averages should be reported to the first decimal place. Uh, if our data points had two decimal places, then our average should be three decimal places. Calculating the arithmetic mean uh, is fairly easily in, easy in R. Uh, we can do it 
two, two ways. We could do it the easy way, which uses just the mean uh, because it's already built in, or we could do it the longhand and actually write the equation. So here I will actually demonstrate it both ways. So the first thing we need to do when calculating means is to create our vector. So I'm going to reduce the size so I can, I can see it. So I will create the vector using the C, 5, 6, 6, 7, 7, 8, 9, and 12. Run it. Now x is in there. All right, and then I'm going to calculate the mean the long way. So the mean is the sum of our x's divided by the sample size. And what you will notice is that I utilize the sum function. So sum of the x's, where na dot rm equals t, that na dot rm is going to remove any missing data before it calculates the sum. And then we need to know the sample size. What I am going to do is use the length. Now the length just counts up how many rows are in our data set. If we had missing data, it would count the, that row as part of the sample size, but it's not. The data is missing. So what we can do is use something called subscripting, which is brackets uh, after our value, to select all of the non-missing data. And that's what this exclamation point is dot na is doing. So it's saying, I want to take all of the values of x, so all of the values of x that are not missing. And for that, then tell me the length, how many rows are there. When I run that, we'll get our output 7.5, and that matches what we should have done. Now, I don't suggest doing it this long way. I show it so that you can see that we can do the sum and we can do the length. Uh, of vectors, I think the easier way is just to use the built-in function mean x na.rm equals t. Now if you don't have any missing data then you don't need the na.rm but if you're given a big data set and you're unsure if there's any if there's missing data or not then go ahead and use it it doesn't hurt. So again using the built-in code R gives us the exact same answer that we calculated by hand. So just for practice, we had those three averages. Uh, what I want you to do is calculate the averages uh, in R and confirm that you obtained the exact same averages that I did. So hopefully in R Studio, you were able to obtain these averages. Here's how I would do it. We already have the vector made, so I would just take the mean of that vector that we created and run it. Uh, we don't have any missing data so I will leave it off and all of them will be exactly what I calculated when I initially created this presentation. Why is that? Well go back up to the top. We set the seed of our random number generator so we set the starting point and now everyone will obtain the exact same sequence of numbers and when we calculate the means we will all calculate the exact same means. Another type of average is a weighted average. This is basically uh, the arithmetic average. Uh, it's calculated the same but now what we do is we weight each of our values. When, you, you, when would you use something like this? Well you would use it if you have averages and you're trying to find the average of those averages. It's a case where we have the averages represent different sample sizes. If we ignored the different sample sizes then each average carries the same weight. But if we're looking for the overall average then what we want to do is weight those values based on how many samples we have uh, in, in each of those, those samples. So the equation is this. It's the sum of our x's times their weight divided by the number of weights that we have in there. Um, I'll demonstrate this as an example. Uh, the r function is weighted.mean. We'll give it a value of x's and then a value of corresponding weights. 
There is also an na.rm uh, that we can remove data points that are missing, but if you're going to generate your own x, uh, your own vector of x's and your own vector of weights, then I doubt that you will include missing data. So chances are you can just ignore it. So here's a data set where it would be good to use a weighted mean function. So let's say I recorded the average for my last five biostatistics courses. Now these are just made up numbers, uh, it's made up class sizes, made up averages, I'm just doing this to prove a point. So I have five different class sizes, uh, each class differed, and each class had its own average. Now if I did it calculated, or if I was interested in the average grade of the biometry classes, you may be tempted to just take the averages. So the average sum of the x's over our sample size. So if I add up all of these columns, where the sum is equal to uh, 411, then I plug it in, and I've got five class sizes, I would get an average of 82.2. Is that correct? No, this isn't right. We shouldn't be doing this at all. And you might ask why. Well, look at our averages. We have a 74% average. When we do it this traditional way, it assumes that each of our averages has the same amount of weight. But that class that scored the 74% had only 10 students. So what we're doing is that each student of 10 basically has the same weight to the overall average as this class of 22 and had a class, that had an average of 87. So what we want to do is account for these differences in class sizes and we do so using our weighted average. So our weighted average is calculated as the sum of our weights times our x's divided by the sum of our weights. So our weights are as the class size itself. So we'll do 12 times the average 81 plus 18 times the weighted average of 90 plus 22 times 87 plus 10 times 74 plus 16 times 79. And we're going to divide it by the sum of the weights. Sum of the weights here is 78. So I had 78 students who took Biostats course. When I run this calculation, now our weighted average actually gives 83.5. Notice the difference. When we ignored the differences in class size, we obtained an average of 82.2. That lower number is essentially due to that. We've assigned unnecessary weight to a 74% when we only had 10 students in the class. So I showed you how to do weighted averages by hand. We can also do weighted averages in, in R. So our weighted average is going to use the weighted mean function. So weighted dot mean, and we need two vectors. All right, a vector of our values. So we'll do class dot size. All right, so these are the numbers from the example problem uh, that I did by hand. And we need a, the actual x's. So again, these are the averages that I used when we worked it by hand. Now, our weighted mean is going to take our x's, so x equals the class.av, and our weights is equal to the class size. Now, I don't need na.rm because I didn't include any missing data. When I run this, I get 83.46, which is exactly what I calculated uh, when I did it by hand. So as you can see, weighted averages aren't terribly difficult, 
Uh, you just have to know that if you're going to calculate an average and our sample sizes used to calculate those averages are unequal, then you need to somehow weight each average by its class size. Other than averages of classes, uh, is there another time when we'd use weighted averages? Yes. Uh, the most common one that we will use in this class is trying to calculate averages of frequency tables. Uh, we can calculate this by hand or we can calculate it in R. So what I'll do first is show you how we can calculate the average of frequency tables uh, by doing some simple, by adding on some col columns and doing some simple arithmetic. Here is a frequency table that was in the presentation. What we want to do is calculate the average of this frequency table. So we are interested in the average of x. So calculate x bar. All right, so this is the x's, the x column. What we're going to see is that this frequency table actually represents a vector where we have 18 zeros, we have 33 ones, 27 twos, 16 threes, two fours, and four fives. This is exactly what our vector of AVE3 looks like. If, you're, if you don't believe me, go ahead, go back to R, type in AVE3, and look at the numbers. What you will see is that there's a bunch of zeros, ones, twos, threes, fours, and fives, and if you make a table of that, this is what this is what it looks like. You've got 18 zeros, 33 ones, 27 twos, 16 threes, twos, fours, and four fives. So our data points are actually these x's, and that's what we want to calculate the averages of. But we have different numbers, different frequencies, or the different weights. So in order to calculate the average of x, we're going to use the weighted mean formula. But this time, I'm going to replace w with x so that it reflects what we are going to do here. So we need the sum of f times x and we need the sum of f. So the sum of this f column is equal to our total sample size. And remember, we don't have any missing data, so the sum of that column will equal 100. Next, we need to do the fx column. So I'm going to extend this table and multiply my x by the frequency. So 0 times 18 is 0. 1 times 33. What is x is? Times 33 is 33. 2 times 27 is 54. 3 times 16 is 48. 4 times 2 is 8 and 5 times 4 is 20. All right, so that's f times x, and now what we want is the sum of fx, which is the sum of this column. So I can take my calculator, add each of these values up, and I get 163. So now I just plug these values into my equation. 163 divided by 100, and I get an average of 1.63. But remember rounding. We could leave it here as 1.63, but our actual raw data only goes to the ones digit, so we really should round to the tenths place. So our average is 1.6. Just for practice, here's another frequency table. Assume you went out and counted different nests of birds. Uh, we'll assume all of the birds laid uh, six eggs and all six eggs hatched, and then you went and recorded how many male birds were in that nest uh, and how many female birds were in that nest. So that nest can have zero males out of six, one male out of six, two, three, four, five, or six males out of those six offspring. Now, out of all of the nests, you recorded how many nests had zero males, how many nests had 22 males, how many had uh, six, 
let's see here, how many had two males and three males and four males and five males and six males, and here's our data. So our question is, what is the average number of males, average number of males per nest? Well, we want the averages of this 0 through 6 column. That's what we want. And we recognize that there are different numbers, different weights for each of these x's. So we are going to use the weighted mean function. fx over the sum of the f. So x, that's our number of males. f, that's our number of clutches. So, pause the video. Take some time, try to calculate your average. All right, so first thing I'm going to do is add up this column. When I add up that column, I get 250. So there's 250 nests that we examined and recorded uh, the number of males. So now what we have to do is calculate this fx column. So fx, that is just multiplication right across. So 0 times 3, 1 times 22, 2 times 64, 3 times 81, which is 243. 4 times 59. I have to bust out my calculator to do that. 236. 5 times 17, which I think is 85. And 6 times 4, 24. This, when we add them all up, is the sum of the fx column which will be 738. So now our average is 738 divided by 250, which is 2.952. Now again, we're going to round, uh, and we always try to round to one more digit than the data that we collected. So our answer would be it's about three. So 3.0 males per clutch. So about half, 50-50 chance of being male or female. You've seen how to calculate the average of this frequency table by hand and we worked through a practice problem. Can we do this in R? Of course we can. There's actually two ways to do this in R. The first way uses the weighted dot mean function. Now, I don't recommend doing this, but it's a possibility, and I'll show you how. So the first thing that we have to do is generate the vector of the x's. So I'm going to use c and just list each of the values in our vector. I do the same thing for the weights, which is the f column. And then, I just pass the x vector and the f vector to the weighted mean function. When I do, I get the average of 1.64, or 1.63. This is exactly the mean that we calculated when we did it by hand, and it's also exactly the mean that we calculated when we ignored the vector. If you have the vector, this can work, although calculating just using the mean function works even easier. When you're only given the frequency table, my recommendation is to do it this second method. So the second method is preferred because this is what you have to do in order to calculate the variances and standard deviations anyways. So if you're going to calculate the mean, might as well uh, the mean as well, might as well do this step. So our vector or this table represents a vector of va of values that are repeated. So we have 18 zeros, 33 ones, 27 twos, 16 threes, two fours, and four fives. 
If you don't believe me, all we have to do is look at the look at the vector. This is a bunch of zeros, ones, twos, threes, fours, and fives. And if I issue the table function, that's what it says. I have 18 zeros, 33 ones, 27 twos, 16 threes, twos, fours, and fours, fives. Now the question is, how do I take this frequency table and convert it back to the vector? In order to do that, we're going to use some. We're going to use a function called repeat, or the rep, rep function. What this is going to do is repeat some value that we give it a certain number of times. So I repeated 7 10 times, and when I run it, I produce this output. Now, what if we have a different number? So let's say we want to repeat 5, but do it 200 times. Well, it generates a vector of 5 200 different times, or 200 fives. This also works if we wanted to use text. So now I repeated GMC 200 times. I can repeat it another value 5 times. So do F for female, and it gives us a vector of F. So what we can do is create a vector of sex, for example, C male, C female, and say, okay, we've got males and females, and then set up the frequencies of each. So in this example, I've seen five males and eight females. Just like what we would have in a frequency table. We'd have males, uh, male, and then five for the frequency, female in the second row, eight under the frequency. So once we have those vectors, then we issue the repeat function to say, I want to repeat sex frequency number of times. And what R does is goes item by item. So since male is the first item, when it looks at the times vector, it looks at the very first item as well, which is five, and says, okay, I'm going to repeat male five times, or I'm going to repeat female eight times. And when you run it, you get a vector of 13 items where we, we repeated male five times and then we repeated female eight times. So what we want to do is to convert our frequency table then into a single vector. We have our vector of x's, so vector of x's, and we have a vector of frequencies. All right. And then what we're going to do is create a new vector by using the repeat function. So we will repeat the vector x the frequency number of times. Once we do that, then we can actually calculate the mean of that vector, which is 1.63. Now, our vec is going to look different from the actual average vector, uh, and that's to be expected. AVE3 was randomly generated. For VEC, we generated ourself. But we can also sort it. And you'll see that the AV3 vector is the same as the vector that we generated. So now, just for practice, go back and create a vector of uh, the clutch sizes from the example. Uh, and calculate the mean. Show that R will actually calculate a mean number of males per nest at 3.0. So hopefully you are able to create your vector and calculate the average fairly easily. Here's how I did it. I created a vector called num.males. This is just that x column, that x vector. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. I created a vector called nests. Uh, this has 3, 22, 64, 81, 59, 17, 4. And then I created my single vector of males where I repeated these x's nest number of times. Once I did that, then I just issued the mean function on males and I get 2.952, which rounds to 3.0. Now, did I have to give it these descriptive names? Nope, I didn't. I could do X, I can do F, 
I can do vec and do vec and run it and I get the same number so it's just kinda what you name the vectors is up to you uh, I often like to give things a little bit more descriptive names because if I see these two things I'll think X and F mean the same thing even though we're dealing with two different data sets but we come up with the same answer we come up with the answer that we needed to come up with so it doesn't really matter there are some other means uh, that we can talk about so we calculate the arithmetic mean that's the mean that you would think of if we calculate averages for classes and so forth or average weights average lengths uh, but we also have a geometric mean and we have a harmonic mean uh, that you might want to use the geometric mean is probably the second most used mean out there we would use the geometric mean when our data is when our data are on ec the exponential scale so this scale would be like serial dilutions if you're trying to do antibody titers for example you serially dilute uh, the blood serum in order to generate the antibodies uh, those antibodies don't follow a linear scale they're on the exponential scale so we could take the geometric mean uh, we would use geometric mean if our sizes uh, if our data points span several orders of magnitude uh, for example, if we grew yeast in vials and we estimated population size of yeast in those vials, we can have you know, differences of, thou of a thousand or ten thousands, just kind of depending on what our starting yeast cells are. So even though we try to start with ten cells, some, cell some vials may start with twenty, some may vials may start with two. Uh, over a defined period of time, you can have a very large range of total population size. So arithmetic means wouldn't be appropriate geometric mean would be appropriate uh, also we would use the geometric mean whenever we talk about population growth rates so if we measured the grow growth rates uh, this year measured growth rates next year and then measured uh, population growth rates a third year we wouldn't average them because the population growth rates are on an exponential scale think back to our equation uh, it was uh, e raised so our initial population size times e raised to the rt value well yeah the rates are on the exponential scale so if you're going to calculate the averages you take the geometric mean the purpose of this geometric mean is really to normalize the range uh, it takes all of those values and then kind of compresses them uh, and puts them closer to the linear scale so that the arithmetic mean actually works uh, this would be the same as taking the logs of our data values or of our data points and then calculate the averages so the averages of the logs is actually the geometric mean of our untransformed data the harmonic mean uh, is used for rates that are often stated as reciprocals so um, they uh, not quite a speed because remember speed has it's not necessarily a rate it has natural ordering but if we had uh, average time for specific differences uh, example would be you measured some, how far someone ran a mile the first mile then you measured how long it took them to, to run the next two miles and then how long it took them to, to run the final one mile so you had one mile two miles and one miles that's rates and what you would do if we're looking at the average rate across the entire four mile stretch we would use a harmonic mean this would basically be the average of of, of rates uh, are we going to calculate them no that's why I'm, i don't give you the the equations here um, are we going to calculate them in r no we won't uh, but i do want you to know when we use them so anytime we we have rates we're going to we're going to use the harmonic mean anytime we have data on the exponential scale we will use the geometric mean G examples of the geometric mean anything with serial dilutions population growth rates or if you have values that span several orders of magnitude so you'd have tens hundreds thousands maybe ten thousands in your data set what else do we need to know well we should know the relationships 
So if we were to take a data set and calculate the arithmetic mean, the geometric mean, and the harmonic mean, what we would see is that the arithmetic mean gives us the largest number, the largest average, geometric mean gives us the next largest average, and the harmonic mean gives us uh, the smallest average. Uh, does this mean they're all wrong? No, they, they follow equations. If you did the equation correctly, then they're correct. Uh, but if you misused it, then yeah, maybe you, you're not actually representing the midpoint of our data. So uh, if you calculate the geometric mean, then you should know that the arithmetic mean will be larger, harmonic mean would be smaller. The second measure of central tendency is median. Median is a statistic of location where we have equal number of values on each side of it. So it's basically the middle point of all of our data points, not the average. It's in terms of the middle point of the total count or sample size. So we have some simple conventions when calculating the median. If you have an odd number of data points, so let's say seven data points, then the median is the middle number. So with seven data points, the median number is four. You'd have three points below it, three points above it, and item number four is your median. If you have an even number of data points, then the actual median value is going to be is going to fall between the two middle values. So if we have six data points, our median is going to be between items number three and four. What is the median then? Well, what we'll do is take the average of those two med middle numbers. Uh, what if those numbers are the same? If we have duplicates, well, duplicate values won't change our rules. We will still take the middle value uh, or the average of the two middle values depending on our sample size. That includes our duplicates. Uh, so, for example, uh, let's work some by hand. These are two examples of calculating medians. We'll start with example number one. If we add up our sample size, you'll see that we have an odd number of samples. So n is equal to nine. Based on our rule, our median will be the middle number. Right there. With this median, you'll see that we have an equal number of items to the left and an equal number of items to the right. So we've got four numbers to the left of the median, four numbers to the right of the median. That's what defines our median. In example two, our sample size is an even number. If we count up our sample size, you'll see that we have 12 items. Now we don't really have a, a number that is completely in the middle with equal number of items to, uh, to both sides, but instead we have our median falling between our two middle values. We still have an equal number to the left and to the right, but our, we don't, our median doesn't really fall on an exact number. So our median here represents the average of the two numbers. So 6 plus 8 over 2 is 7. Our median in this case is 7. You'll notice that I use duplicate numbers uh, in both of these examples. I just want to emphasize again that it doesn't matter if we have repeat numbers. Each number counts as an item regardless if it, can, if it appears once or if it appears three times. If it appears three times, we have three items. Um, if it appears once, we only have one item. So don't panic if we have uh, duplicate numbers when trying to calculate our medians. You saw how we calculated medians by hand. Can we do it in R? Of course. The function in R is median. When we run this function, we will give it a vector, a numeric vector, and we have the option to, to tell it to remove missing values before it calculates a median. If we have an NA in our vector, the median function will fail. Uh, do we have to include it? No. Usually, the data that, that we work with 
doesn't have any missing data points, but if it's your own data set, then there is a possibility that we'll, we will miss some data. So how do we calculate it? Well, here's our R script again. Uh, continuing, I've got my medians. So what we will do is generate an example. We will first make a vector. I'll call it EX1. And I will just make a random set of data. So in this data set, we can count up how many items we have. We have five items there. We have five items there. So our mental math says that our median is going to fall in the middle between these two numbers. Our rule says that the median is the average of those two middle numbers, so 4.5. In order to calculate this median, all that we do is issue the median command and our vector. Do we need na.rm equals t? Nope, not really. We didn't make a, a vector with missing data. So when I run this chunk, you will see that I obtained the median 4.5. That is exactly how we calculated it. So another statistic related to medians is quantiles and quartiles. Now, while quantiles and quartiles are measures of dispersion or spread of the data, I'm going to talk, talk about them now as measures of central tendency uh, because they are related to the median. Uh, in fact, we will calculate quartiles the same way that we do medians. So what is a quartile and what is a quantile? Well, I'll start with a quantile. A quantile is an X percentage point in the distribution. So if we have if we are looking for the uh, 10, 10 percentage value, what that means is that we would have, uh, whatever point that is, we'd have 10% of the values to the left of it, and then 90% of our values above it. Uh, uh, we can also say the 30th quantile. That means that that point has the 30% of points to the left, 70% to the right. So the quantiles always uh, is always reported from small to large. Quartiles are specific quantiles. So the quartile values divide the distribution into fourths. So a quartile would be the 25th uh, quantile, or 25%, the 50th quantile, or 50%, and the 75%, or the 75th quantile. The median by definition is the 50 percentage point or the 50th quantile. Now with these percentages we would say the 25th percent or the 25 percent uh, quartile. 25th quantile is the first quartile. The 75 percent point is the third quartile. So quantile refers to the percentage and then the quartiles would be the first quartile, second quartile which is the median, and the third quartile, which is a 75%. We use the quartiles to calculate an interquartile range, which is our measure of spread or dispersion. Uh, when we calculate these quartiles and these quantiles, we will calculate them the same way uh, as we calculated the median. So when we have the median, we have points that fall below it, and we have points that fall above it. Our quartile will be the median of the lower points, that's our first quartile. The third quartile would be the median of our upper points. Are we going to qu calculate quantiles? No. We will only calculate quartiles by hands. The quantiles come into play when we're trying to calculate confidence intervals, and we will do some of those quantiles later. So now let's look at some examples to calculate quartiles by hand. Here are two examples for calculating our quartiles. So just remember, our first quartile will be calculated as the median of the bottom half of our values. The third quartile will be the median of the upper half. When we calculate medians uh, of these halves, or I should say 
the quartiles. There's a couple different ways uh, to calculate them, a couple different ways to calculate them based on the, the sample size as well as whether or not we have duplicates. I'm going to show you this way uh, because I think it's the easiest way to, to memorize uh, and it, it, it's just one of the ways in which we can calculate it. So example number one, we have 14 uh, items in our data set. So what we would do is start with our median. So 14 items, uh, even number of items, that means our median is going to be the average of two values. So our median is going to fall someplace right here, which is the average of 5 and 6. Then what we will do is break our halves into an upper and lower half. Our first quartile is the median of that bottom half. So if we think about it and say, well, in this bottom half I have n equals 7, and in this upper half I have n equals 7, then our median is going to be the middle point of these two values. I'm sorry, not our median, our quartile. So number 2 represents our first quartile. Our third quartile is the median of the upper half. There's our third quartile. So I think this is probably the easiest way to do our quartiles. In example two, we ha also have an even sample size. So our median is going to fall between two points. So our median is going to be the average of those two points. And since they're the same, the average of two identical numbers is that same number. We then kind of break our upper and lower data points by that median value and you will notice that we have now an even number of points. This doesn't change how we calculate medians. When we have an even number we just take the average of our two points. So our quartile represents the median of that bottom half. So our first quartile is going to fall between 2 and 4, which is the average of those two values, 3. That is our first quartile. We do the same thing for the upper our third quartile is the average of the two middle points which is 8.5 now as I said there's different ways to calculate the quartiles uh, and calculate relating quantiles this is the way that we'll use when we do the quartiles because I feel like it's an easy way to remember and it's a pretty easy way to go ahead and mark our data sets So we saw how to calculate quartiles by hand. Can we use R? Yes, we can. But there isn't a quartile function in R. Instead, we will use the quantile function. The quantile function will take a vector, x values, and will return the quantiles that we want it to return to us. Uh, the quantiles will be listed as a vector of percentages, or a vector of quantiles. Um, if we only want to calculate the quantiles, then just leave it alone. The default is to report the zero, uh, zero percentile, 25th percentile, 50th percentile, and the 75th percentile, and the 100th percentile. Uh, if we wanted, let's say, 95%, then we'd have to actually state it, and we'll give examples. Uh, Na.rm equals t is also another switch that says when we calculate our quantiles, first remove all missing values. So how do we specify the, the quantiles that we want? We're, we're going to use probs, which is our option. And this can be tricky. So as I said, the default gives us the uh, zero, first quartile, second quartile, third quartile, and the fourth quartile, which represents zero, 25th uh, percentile or quartile, I'm sorry, quantile, 50th quantile, 75th quantile, and the 100% quantile.
that's our default. If we leave it alone, these are the numbers that we get. If we only wanted to get the first, second, and third quartiles, then we would say probs equals C and these numbers. So probs needs a vector, that's why we need to give it the C. If we were interested in calculating a 95% confidence interval, then what we want is 95% of our values to fall around our median value. That means we are looking at the 2.5 percentile and the 97.5 percentile, or the uh, two and a half quantile and the 97 and a half quantile. If we are looking for cutoffs, so 95% cutoffs, which, which we can do for area under the curves, then we can use 0 0.05, the 5 percentile, or the, the fifth quantile. If we are looking for the cutoff in a lower tail distribution, so the bottom part of our tail, if we are looking for the upper part of the tail, then we would use our 95th percentile or the 95th quantile. All right, so for example, uh, and how to do this in R, uh, we have two data vectors. What we are going to do is create our vectors from these data and calculate our quantile. So uh, take some time, create the, these two vectors in R, and then I will show you how to do the uh, quantiles, medians, and the percentiles. All right, so hopefully you have your data. So I made it an R with the vectors, dat1, dat2. I already ran my chunk, so you can see that I have it in there. So the first part was to calculate the median, quartiles, and 95% quantile for dat1. So for the median, I could easily just issue the median command, and it will calculate it. For the quartiles, I need to use the quantile function. So quantile dat1. So the probs by default gives us the quartiles that we need. So 60 was the median, and then the quantile function returns this by default. If we wanted to specify it by hand, and we were only interested in the first, second, and third quartiles, or perhaps let's say the uh, first and third quartile, then what I can do is specify my probs and say, okay, my first quartile is the 25th percentile, so 0 0.25, and the third is, is, is the 75th quantile, or the 0 0.75. When I run that, I get my 50 and 85. So using this notation then, I can easily adapt it to the 95% value. Quantile dat1 probs equals C 0 0.95. And when I run it, I get 95.5. Now, you'll notice I'm, I'm using control enter to run each line individually. But if when I run the chunk, I get all four commands appearing uh, and giving me the output. So what about example two? Take some time, pause this video, try to calculate these values for dat two. All right, so for dat two, hopefully you, you can see that we can do all of this in one line, or perhaps you did it separately, which is also okay. So I'll use median dat2, and I get a median of 6. For these last quantiles, I can do it all in one command. So I need the 2.5% and the 97.5%, which gives us a 95% confidence interval. So I will specify probs. I want 0 0.025 and 0 0.975. And we get... 1.3 and 9.4. Are there al alternative ways? Yeah, there are. So here's an alternative method, and it's one that I often use. It's the summary function. If I do the summary of our data, it will give us minimum 
first quartile, the median, the mean, the third quartile, and the maximum value. That basically gives us everything that we were interested in finding out in uh, the means, the medians, and the quartiles. It does it in a single output. And you'll see that for DAT2, we get the exact, we get the same values. So DAT1, quartile was 50 and 85, we got 50 and 85. So there, there are alternative methods to arrive at the same answer. Um, median and quantile uh, are used later on in the course. Summary is good just to kind of check your data. Now before we, we move on, I wanted to go back and talk about how quantiles are calculated. If we look up the quantile command and look at the help file, it gives us the default way to, to run this. And then you'll see we have an option type. The de default is 7, type 7. And it's because there are nine different ways to, to calculate quantiles and quartiles. And they all come down to duplicate numbers, you know, how do you handle duplicate numbers, how do you handle odd versus even numbers, what do you do if the median falls between two values, what happens if it falls between two values and you have duplicate values above it, and so forth. So there's many different ways. The default is 7, which will pretty much give us uh, how we do it by hand, um, but at least for the median, but the quartiles could be off. So types 1, 2, and 3 you'll see are for uh, what are called discontinuous sample quantile types. So uh, for a discrete type of data, you can use it. Uh, if we have continuous data, then you can use 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, or 9. Uh, they've got different functions on how to calculate medians and so forth. And you'll see that type 7 is used by S by default. Um, type 6 is used by Minitab and SPSS. So if you're using S or if you're using SPSS and you see that R produces different uh, quartiles or quantiles, then uh, check the help file, see if there's a different way, a different method of calculating these quartiles. We will just continue to use the default uh, and not worry too much about it. So we've learned how to do medians and we learned how to do quantiles. Now you should probably be asking, when do we choose a median? When do we use mean when reporting location or tenden our central tendency summary statistic? It kind of comes down to the distribution of data itself. So if our data are skewed or if we are asymmetric around the middle point, then medians are going to be a more accurate representation of central tendency because it doesn't really rely on the actual value. It only relies on the number. So salaries and home prices, these are strongly skewed data points. Uh, means don't really represent the actual middle number. So for example, let's look at uh, median home prices or average home prices here in San Angelo. Most of the homes that we look at have a median home price of about $130,000 to $150,000. But if we look at the average home prices, you'll see that the average home prices might be around $180,000 to $200,000. Well, why the difference between median and mean? It comes down to our distribution. In our home prices, we have several homes that are really expensive, so $800,000 plus. Uh, you have some that are $1 million, $2 million, $3 million, $4 million homes here in San Angelo. Well, those super large values are causing, are unduly moving the average too high. So that's why our average is one eighty to $200,000. $200, but does that actually represent the average type of home? No, not really. If we're looking at like cost of living, what we're more interested in is the median. Where do most people buy their homes? Uh, you know, how much do most of the homes sell for? Well, that's our median price, so 130 to 150. Same thing with salaries. If we look at average salary in the U.S., you have a couple people that are making uh, unbelievably large sums of money. Bill Gates, for example, Warren Buffett. I mean billions of dollars every year and that's pulling up our averages 
Uh, so these distributions are strongly skewed. They're asymmetric around our setter points. We use median. Another time when we could use mean uh, or medians is if we're limited on time and or resources. So uh, here's a situation where uh, we can't really collect all possible data points or at least a good sample of data points because it takes too long or perhaps it's too expensive. So what we do is collect uh, different points along the way and then infer what our middle points are going to be. Uh, lethal dose 50s ld 50s is an example so what we would do with with the with an ld 50 is we're interested in a concentration of a chemical that results in death of organisms uh, in some cases we can't test every single distribution so what we do is do serial dilutions of those chemicals uh, and we record how many organisms die at each con concentration well we're going to have a, a, a situation where all of them survive at one concentration and then let's say 80 percent of them die at that at that next higher concentration so our actual lethal dose is going to fall someplace between those two values uh, that ends up being the median between those points so that's our ld50 uh, it's more like toxicity studies environmental studies that's where we see those um, are we going to do these in class? No, I, I won't show you. But if you are doing this uh, as part of a research project, feel free to come talk to me. I can show you how to calculate LD50s. The last measure of central tendency, and it's not necessarily a central tendency per se, but we group it here um, with central tendency is the statistic mode. The mode represents the most common value in a frequency distribution. This would represent our peak in the histogram uh, or the largest frequency number in a frequency table. We're interested in the mode uh, in some cases because we want to know the most frequent value that we encounter. So for a frequency table, perhaps we're interested in the most common shirt color. Okay, we would use the mode. Um, but in other times, especially with continuous or discrete data, we're interested to see how many modes do we have. Does it appear like we have, that we have uh, a, a single peak or a single mode in our data set, which would be unimodal? Does it look like we have two different peaks in our data set, so more of a bimodal distribution? Or perhaps we have more than two peaks, which would make it multimodal. Uh, and our ultimate is this antimodal, which means we don't really have a peak at all. This is more like a, a U-shaped type curve. Um, I'll note with the bimodal, multimodal type curves, we don't, we don't need the peaks to be at exactly the same height, but we need to see evidence where we have a common value, and then around it, the frequencies drop off. Um, the use of the mode is pretty limited uh, in especially well it's pretty limited in biology uh, so you know we don't spend a whole lot of time time on it just know that it is the most common value in our frequency distribution all right so let's give us a, a review uh, we have different measures of central tendency uh, that, that we would use uh, first is the mean that's going to be our preferred method uh, the mean has a smaller standard error uh, associated with it. Uh, it's easy to work with mathematically. The equations are defined. We can calculate it by hand, and we can calculate it in R pretty easily. When we calculate means of multiple samples, then the means, the distribution of all of the collection of means, tend to follow a normal distribution, even if the underlying data do not. So if you have uh, multiple samples and all of our samples follow let's say a chi-square distribution which is skewed the mean of those chi-square distributions are normally distributed even though the underlying distributions are, are chi-square why is this important well a lot of our statistical tests assume this normal distribution and if we work with the means then the means follow a normal distribution the downside of the mean is that we're affected by outliers and we're affected by the shape of the distribution. Okay, so uh, if we are skewed, our mean tends to uh, fall towards the tails uh, and is more affected by those extreme values than our alternative 
measures of central tendency. Our second choice is going to be the median. That is going to be used when we have skewed data uh, or outliers, when we have an extreme data point. Um, we prefer the median because it's not sensitive to that. It doesn't care really what the value of our points are, it just can, cares about the count. What number is it in our sequence of data? Speaking of distributions, when we have a normal distribution, then our mean is equal to the median, it's equal to the mode. So our peak in that distribution of that bell curve represents the mode. Our mean falls right at the peak and the median falls right at the peak. If we're skewed, then things start to change. So now as we skew left, I mean the tail goes to the left, our mode still represents the peak. Then our median gets pulled up and then our mean. Uh, if we have a right tail, it's the reverse. Um, and I, I have some figures to, to help demonstrate this. So here are the three different distributions that I mentioned. So our normal distribution is that bell-shaped curve. If we look at this normal distribution, our mean and median and mode all fall at the same point. So our x bar is equal to the median, is equal to the mode. If we're skewed, then our mean, medians, and modes are not the same. So if we are skewed left, our distribution is leaning to the right. It gets its name skewed left because we have an excess number of points in our tail, which is to the left of the peak. So we have an excess number of small values that is pulling down our distribution, pulling down our mean. So our peak still represents the mode. Our mean is going to be moved closer to the tail. And our median is going to fall someplace in between. So our, median, our mean is sensitive to extreme values. And in this case, we have extreme values in the tail region that's going to make the mean smaller than what, uh, than what our central distribution actually looks like. If we are skewed right, then we're going to be leaning left. So we are left leaning. With the skewed right, we have an excess number of points to the right of our peak, hence its name skewed right. With those excess number of points, it's going to elevate our mean. So our mean is going to be more towards the tail region. Our median is also going to be pulled up because we're dealing with a number of points, but it's going to be smaller than our mean. And our mode still represents the most common number, or the peak. So you should know the relationships. Uh, if you calculated a mean, uh, and I told you that uh, the distribution is skewed left, I ask you what is the relative value of the median? Is it greater than or less than the mean? You should know that it's greater than uh, the mean for skewed left distributions. It's less than the mean for skewed right. As a transition, uh, towards our spread or uh, dispersion pattern. Our sample statistics, so statistics of location and dispersion, always want to approximate our population parameters. We always want to pick a statistic that remains unbiased, which means that our means will approximate our, our population's uh, parameter and so forth. If our statistics don't approximate our population parameters, then we would say that our statistic is biased. So it's either too large or too small. When we work with a sample mean and a variance, these are what we would term unbiased estimators. The sample mean approximates the population parameter. Our sample variance approximates the population level parameter variance. We don't normally use variances uh, because they're susceptible to sample sizes. 
So as you increase your sample sizes, your variances are, are going to increase. Uh, so what we would tend to use is something called the standard deviation. Now, unfortunately, the standard deviation is biased. It's standard deviation or sample standard deviation is always going to be lower than our population parameter. However, as our samples start to become larger, that bias can be ignored. So if you have a sample size of three, the sample standard deviation versus the population standard deviation will be different and it'll be uh, a large difference, mind you. It's not huge, but it's larger than if we compare a sample size of 10. As we get to a sample size of 30 or a sample size of 50, then the sample standard deviation really does start to approximate the population level parameter. We're dealing with decimal point differences now. Uh, so is this gonna be an issue for us when we calculate stuff? No, it won't be. Um, but I just wanted to let you know that when dealing with bias, uh, mean and variances are unbiased estimators standard deviations are biased estimators.